Okay, perfect. Here we are with Morgan Brown. Morgan, thank you so much for your time. Um, Morgan, is uh, you are currently the CGO of Shopify. Am I right? Yeah, I'm the VP of Growth Marketing at Shopify. Um, so I'm responsible for all of the performance uh, and organic marketing teams, email marketing teams, uh, and uh, our growth products team. So yeah, responsible for uh, getting more merchants uh, on Shopify and making them successful with with our product. That's that's pretty cool. I, I don't want to sound like a you know a groupie, but of course I I prepared this one <laughs> for oh, the interview. Nice. Awesome! That's great. I, I love your book, man. Uh, Thank you. I mean, uh, you are also one of the two you know author of Hacking Growth. This is probably the the best book out there about growth hacking. Uh, so I will that. start. Thanks. I will start with a simple one. Are you gonna write a, a new book? <laughs> I'm waiting for a new one. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, think... I'm waiting for a new one. <laughs> awesome. I, well, thank you so much, and I'm super excited to be here, Raf. Uh, this is great to talk uh, growth with you because I admire all the uh, content and thought and and your work in the space. So it's awesome to connect with super smart growth uh, growth people around the world. Um, yeah, I think I tell my wife. Uh, so we have three kids. Uh, I tell my wife writing a book is probably like having a child. Uh, where uh, when you have a kid, you're like, I'm done. That's it. You know, and then after, <laughs> this is the last one. <laughs> it's so much work. This is the last one. And then after a few years, all of the hard pain and, and trouble of kind of uh, raising the child kind of goes away. And you're like, oh, we should do this again. So um, I would never say never. But I think uh, right now I'm super focused on, on making uh, Shopify merchants successful. And maybe down the road, I'll write another one. But uh, no immediate plans. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, talking about Shopify, I wanted to start with, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the first question that I have for you is uh, kind of, you know, uh, let's say a, a personal one. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, you know, what's the, the the biggest change that you brought to to Shopify since you joined you know, as a you know CGO VP of Growth? Sure. Yeah. So I should say I'm still pretty new at the company. I've only been here for about six months, uh, and Shopify is an amazing company doing a bunch of really interesting things in a bunch of different and important areas. So. Uh, still like learning a lot about the company, but I think the, the biggest things that I've tried to bring early on um, is a couple of things. One, just building out our um, R&D capabilities in marketing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in Hacking Growth, I talk a lot about how you can bring together the power of engineering and design with marketing to really kind of accelerate uh, how you can test and, and learn and that type of thing. And then also trying to really bring um strong uh like very data driven kind of understanding of um you know what is working really well for our merchants and what could be better and i think those things both exist at shopify before i got there and, and obviously the company has been tremendously successful growing way before i ever showed up but i think uh, just kind of helping get to that next level are the the two main in those two areas are kind of the the most immediate uh things that I've been working on since I got here. And what what do you think is the, you know, the the secret behind the the massive growth that Shopify has in yeah. the last, let's say, a couple of years? I don't know. There are no secrets and silver bullets, but you know, yeah, what's, yeah, your, what's the sure. secret? Yeah, I actually think the secret is is a couple of things, um, but the main one is that Shopify's success is really driven by the success of the customer, right? So mm. Shopify is only successful when merchants who choose to use Shopify are successful, right? And so different business models, that's not always true, right? Like if you have an advertising business model, uh, you're typically trying to interrupt someone uh, while they're doing something else uh, so that you can fund uh, all the work that you're doing. Shopify's business model is, uh, only works when merchants are successful. We only, and so that really strong alignment with our customer goals is actually the secret because it creates this really positive uh, flywheel effect where if we can make merchants successful, they tell other merchants, um, we get more Shopify uh, stores and we kind of drive that word of mouth. So I think that, like it's kind of a meta 
answer, mm -hmm. but that fundamental business alignment is um, really, really important. I think the second big secret is uh, Shopify um, is, is uh, you know, building a hundred year company. Like everything, <laughs> everyone says like, we, <laughs> That's it's, cool. they, they mention it constantly, right? It's a constant uh, phrase in inside the company where we're talking about, hey, would this help us become that hundred year company? And so uh, the company takes a very long-term view on things, which keeps us from making, uh, short-sighted decisions that may kind of interrupt yeah. that or, or get in the way of that really strong merchant merchant alignment. Um, and so I think, you know, there those are kind of two main like philosophical approaches and it goes into everything we do. Like if you look at our, our content or the products that we build or, um, you know, the, the information we put out, um, it's all about that helping merchants be successful and, and that drives this big flywheel for us. Staying on that topic, uh, I want to ask you a couple of things about, you know, e-commerce. There are a lot of, you know, yeah. uh, um, small companies and startup and people in e-commerce following and reading my, you know, my content. So yeah. uh, what, what do you think it's in your experience, what's the biggest mistake, you know, that companies make um, approaching e-commerce? Yeah, I th so this is a great question. I think there's a couple of key things that um, I've seen both throughout my career and just at my time at Shopify is right now it's it's so easy uh, to start uh, a store just by picking up a tool. Um, <laughs> you know, kind of you could sign up for a Shopify store really fast. You can find products uh, that you can drop ship. You can um, there's you know it's very easy tactically to kind mm -hmm. of get the ball rolling. Uh, but I think some of the mistakes that I've seen is that uh, for, like there isn't great validation by the entrepreneur if the thing they want to sell is actually something people want to buy. So kind of you know answering the question of if I sell this thing, who is going to buy it and why would they buy it from from me uh, is kind of the the very first thing that uh, people seem to skip. You know, you get excited about starting a store, <laughs> you get excited about this idea, and and then you just kind of like jump in. And I've talked to some entrepreneurs who are like, yeah, I ordered, you know, a thousand, a thousand t-shirts or a thousand uh, coffee mugs. And, uh, but, you know, now they're sitting on this inventory or they've mm. laid out a bunch of cash without really being sure of whether or not there is someone that wants to to buy this. And so I think, you know, in, in Hacking Growth, I talk a lot about kind of like understanding like the, like your end customer, um, you kind of understanding whether the thing that you're offering is something that they really want. Uh, and I think um, that's, that's more of a softer skill, you know, it's not a tool that you can use, but uh, I see that as a big mistake is kind of, um, you know, doing the, the competitive research to see if, uh, you know, do people, are people searching for this? Are, do you, have you talked to some potential customers where they buy it and kind of skipping that step um, is, is kind of a big mistake. And then I think the other second mistake um, is uh, kind of really overly relying on uh, ad platforms to drive, hmm. drive your customers, right? So okay. just thinking you can get the next customer through Facebook ad or Google ad and really thinking about just the acquisition, but not actually um, one, turning them into a long-term repeat customer or a fan of your business um, and not kind of connecting all those dots. And then secondly, um, probably under investing in kind of your own audiences, your own community, uh, and how you build up those assets for the business, um, you know, ahead of time and over time, uh, so mm -hmm. that ultimately, if you if you can do that right, you can drive down your costs of customer acquisition because you're creating this ongoing uh, referral flywheel. So I think those are probably the two biggest uh, mistakes. That's that's super cool. So I totally agree with you, and they are two of the you know main topics uh, I talk about on my YouTube yeah. channel, my podcast. So please, people, validate and create a community. <laughs> Don't forget yeah, about that. <laughs> yeah, I think the community is something you can do even before you start selling stuff. You know, I think yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Put it totally. in yeah. reverse order, but yeah. So I'm completely totally. aligned. Totally. With you. you were speaking about uh, you know acquisition and acquisition channels. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
I was wondering uh, when the uh, let's start always uh, small e-commerce. So sure. when do you think a small e-commerce should focus more on acquisition and when they should focus more on retention? That's kind of you know the 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 the, the question that I get uh, yeah. the most about about you know about e-commerce. Do you think there yeah. is like a a perfect balance between these two situations? Yeah, I think um so I, I don't think of them as either or. I kind of think of them together. You know, they have to, they really, uh, they're like the yin and the yang. They have to, they have to go together um, in, uh, for a, a business to be successful. And I think um, starting from that place is, is really important. But to, to answer specifically the question, yeah, I think very early on when you're kind of thinking about your business model, uh, where your customers might come from, um, you know, what you expect them to buy. I think a lot of this also depends on like the types of products you sell. But yeah, you, I think early on you want to think through, okay, how do I expect customers to find me and where do I need to be in order for them to do that? So if you think, uh, you know, you're selling, um, you know, jewelry or makeup or that type of thing, and you think they're going to be on Instagram, you probably want to think about, okay, how do I build my brand and my audience on Instagram? What are the organic components? What are the paid components? And like, do I think I can actually like do that and have a plan to do that really well? Or if you think it's going to be more about uh, people who have a very real pain point for a specific solution, uh, you know, say you're uh, selling, you know, a product that that helps people in a particular part of their life um, or solve some problem, and you think they'll probably look for that on Google or, or seek that out. Then how do you, um, how do you think about your search strategy? Uh, so I think very early on in the planning phases, uh, it makes a lot of sense, but not too far after that, you want to think about, okay, once someone comes to my site, sure, we, we want them to, you know, but be successful in buying something. But to your point, um, if they're passionate about makeup or jewelry or whatever, how do we kind of get them into our community? How do we ultimately turn them from someone who's discovered us to someone who will go out and spread the word for us and talk, mm -hmm. you know, tell their friends about um, how much they love uh, what, what we're doing. And I, I think small businesses, ex especially entrepreneurs, especially really can benefit from that word of mouth because the, the large channels, you know, it can be hard to rank in Google search for yeah. you know, a very small business. You don't have all of the opportunity to create all the content and all the links that you need and so on. And so, you know, there's um, some great blog posts about, you know, getting a thousand raving fans and yeah. how do you kind of <laughs> really get those initial folks. So I think that thinking about retention, I really kind of think of it through the lens of like, how do you get that thousand raving fans for your, mm -hmm. for your business? Um, and I think that, is about creating opportunities for them to engage with you beyond just buying stuff. So do you have a Facebook group or a, you know, an online community? Do you have community? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Community. Do you have a podcast? Do you have, um, you know, do you have a way for them to go deeper into the thing that they love uh, beyond just buying the thing from you? Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. So again, you are not just selling stuff you are building a community and you should focus on that. That's yeah, that's, that's the main thing. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you what, what you, Raph, you've, you've worked on this a ton. What, what are some of your, your tips? I mean, you're the expert. Yeah. In this oh, well, 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 community and content. This is my, yeah. like, you know, my, my formula. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I want to say, you know, formula because someone could think this is like a magic, you know, tricks or sure. something, but I always think, you know, about, I always start with building a community and you know, having good content out there. Uh, as you said before, most of the time, actually, community first, and then the product. And that's yep. that's kind of you know the 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 best approach nowadays to start a business. Uh, if you want to yeah. do it like you know uh, in a smart way, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a smart. I think way. the nice part about your approach, starting with the community, is you can actually validate if there is interest yeah. in the things you totally. want to sell yeah. before you even take on inventory or worry about. Uh, you know, cost for acquisition and that type of thing. I had some some friends who uh, started a uh, a while ago started a Facebook page on nail art, which is basically mm. you know people doing really 
cool designs with their nail polish. And they grew it to over a million fans or a million uh, page likes on Facebook. This is, this is uh, many years ago. Um, and they built that community to a point where then they could then launch a cosmetics brand into the community. Yeah. And yeah. so they exactly. really validated yeah. that niche and that audience first before they started worrying about selling. Yeah, that's, that's basically what I do with all my clients, all my students, you know, start with a, I don't know, with a landing page, with a Facebook yeah. group. You yeah. know, with that Instagram account, you know, just yeah. try to get the people attention and then yeah. you will build a, a product. It's not the other way around. <laughs> not yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I anymore. think when you do it in that order, the community first and then the sales, you really are thinking about, okay, how do I serve this community, connect people to the things mm. that they're passionate about um, and go deeper in that as opposed to, oh, I'm just trying to sell this thing to this, this yeah. person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes you also get, you know, cool ideas about products yeah. because they yeah. will tell you, I need this, right. you know, and you can build that. So that's that's pretty cool also. That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Things that you wouldn't have even thought of. Yeah. Do, do you see any cool trends in e-commerce for 2021? Yeah, I think there is a ton going on. I think e-commerce actually is going through one of its most transformative periods since the category even launched, you know, beyond beyond like actually being able to take money over the internet, I think now is probably one of the most exciting times um, because you have a, a bunch of things happening uh, all at once that I think are really, really meaningful. You, you so, mean because of the pandemic or? Yeah, yeah, there's like the pandemic, uh, overall consumer trends, technology changes. There's a bunch okay. of uh, factors that are going in, but yeah, starting with the, the pandemic uh, specifically, has shifted a ton of consumer behavior. So, um, you know, on many dimensions. So one, of course, people are spending more money online and it has kind of accelerated people, hmm. you know, going from offline to online. So there's just this general trend. But I think there's a, a other couple important trends that are happening here as well is um, people are, real, are really seeing how important local and independent businesses are to their communities. Um, so, you know, especially in areas uh, here in the States in particular, where um, we've been locked down, you see lots of people looking for ways to support the entrepreneurs in their community, mm. um, whether by, you know, encouraging people to, to shop local, um, encouraging people to um, look out for the restaurants and small business owners order takeout food. And, and I think you're kind of seeing that around the world where, yes, people are moving online but they're also looking for ways that they can continue to support the people in their communities and the local entrepreneurs by doing that. They don't want to go just to all the big marketplaces, yeah. to all the big. And so I think you're seeing um, people changing, not just where their money goes uh, from offline to online, but when they're online, who they're looking for is starting to change. Um, and so they're looking for their, their local business online. And then I think even for local businesses, there's lots of change. Um, uh, uh, the Shopify merchants, we've seen them kind of be able to pivot their retail business to online very quickly uh, because they're so resilient and adaptable. Uh, and there's lots of advantages that they have over maybe the, the larger companies because they offer things like buy online, pick up in store. Um, they offer different things that kind of uh, cross the divide between digital and, and physical, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, and then I think uh, there's big technology shifts that are, that are also driving this. So if you look to Asia um, in terms of like the things that you're seeing in e-commerce, you're seeing lots of like uh, message-based um, uh, buying and selling. Super you're seeing cool. Cool, cool live stream uh, kind of shopping experiences. Um, deeper and deeper integration with social uh, experiences like Shopify just announced yesterday that you can now use ShopPay directly in Instagram. And I think um, all of these trends are converging at a really unique moment in time to, to create lots of opportunities for entrepreneurs. And it's all been, uh, you know, across all age groups, but particularly younger users are, mm -hmm. you know, have kind of like, shifted a lot of their behavior. They discover stuff on social. They want to buy from companies that um, 
that they align with, you know, that they think are, you know, have an impact. Um, they're really worried about kind of the social consciousness aspect of their purchases. And so you, kind of all of these trends play forward in, in really interesting ways that entrepreneurs should be aware of. Um, and Shopify actually puts out kind of a future of commerce uh, report that's online. And uh, there's more trends and data in there, but those are some of the big things that we've been seeing. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I, I, I will search for that and, you know, put a link in the description cool. below. So if you want to know more about trends, that's that's a good place to start. Yeah, uh, sure. yeah I think I think that's pretty cool. And, you know, I, I see a huge opportunity, as you were saying before, um, not only because of the pandemic, but also because, you know, there's a huge, uh, huge news in technology and, and, and yeah. trends and behavior. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. I wanted to move to, to a different topic and talk with you a, a bit about uh, growth hacking. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm gonna st I'm starting with a with a with a you know with a classic with a classic sure. one. Yeah. Do you think there is like a, a a path? What's the best way you know to 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 become a, a growth hacker? Is there a, a path? The best path? Let's say that. Yeah, I, I don't know that there is a, a great path um, that's like super clear, but I think there are a few key things that you can do um, that I think are kind of the building blocks to whatever path uh, you take. So I think the, the first thing is to gain kind of the foundational knowledge, right? So um, understand what growth is and what growth is. And I think one of the like looking back, one of the regrets of like the phrase growth hacking is that it means many things to many different people. It can be everything <laughs> that's, from like that's true. Ter terrible tricks and patterns that are like anti-consumer, yeah, the <laughs> yeah, which I obviously, I'm not a fan of that interpretation. Uh, but if you go all the way to kind of this like hypothesis led um, experimental yeah. and rigorous kind of approach to growth, which is how I think of it. And so I think um, one is like understand how companies and products actually grow. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. Um, you can do a lot of your own research. Like I love to read uh, corporate filings when companies go public, they really talk about their growth engines. Or if you watch investor uh, presentations, they'll you know kind of talk hmm. about how they grow. Um, most of these are on YouTube or on Twitter. You can find them pretty easily. There's also great online resources uh, for growth. So here in the States, um, Reforge is a great growth academy uh, that really kind of takes um, people uh, through the fundamentals of how to build a growth system, how growth works at some of the large technology companies. There's also um, like Conversion XL. Uh, mm. There is like Growth Tribe in uh, Amsterdam. There's the family in France. And so there's lots of uh, great resources and teams that can like help you understand the, the process of growth. And so I think that's that's one. Uh, the second thing is just building up your technical and data uh, chops. So you can use online platforms like uh, Udemy or other e-learning solutions to learn things like SQL, learn some HTML, basically be able to do learn how marketing automation systems work and kind of like get the basics. If you, if you can write SQL uh, and kind of connect to the data in a way that other marketers can't, you have kind of a leg up. So that's kind of the second pillar is the technical skills. And then I think the third one is really practice. I, I think um, <laughs> growth is like law or like medicine, like, you know, all of those professionals practice their profession and you can't get, you know, you can't just read a book, unfortunately, and, and be good at growth. You have to actually practice it. And so I think the good news is, is today, practicing it is easier than ever. You can start a community. You can start a YouTube channel. You can start a podcast. Absolutely. You can start a paid newsletter. You can sell a digital course. You can start a blog um, and so on and so forth. And you can actually practice uh, for very low cost, um, almost free, basically, except for your time and um like, how do I get customers? How do I build a community? How do I retain them? How do I create content that engages with them? And so those are the three components, I think, is like foundational knowledge, technical skill, and practice. That's super cool. That's super cool, absolutely. Uh, growth hacking is one of those things that where you, know, you can read a lot of books, but then after a while, you just have to do stuff. 
that that's it yeah. <laughs> just yeah, go out sure. there you know and yeah. build stuff and you know and and, and try and experiments and, and learn that's 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 the main point i think yeah yeah absolutely. and I, I think the i think the 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 problem that people get into is like when they get in a growth role they they immediately go to like i need to be doing stuff mm. uh and they don't necessarily understand how the business actually grows and so if you don't understand how the business is actually growing you can't really find the leverage in that system to then go make a change like if if your business really relies on organic search to grow and you go off and you're like i'm going to try to like growth hack uh you know twitter or um you know some some other channel sure yeah. that could ultimately be successful but you're you're starting from a point of like zero leverage within the company and i think you find the best growth people when they join companies that are already going um is like okay understand really well what's working and hmm. what's working can you double down and do more of that or if there's something that's kind of it should be performing better or you think should be performing better but isn't going in and really looking for the reasons why it might not be performing as well as expectations and then working on that so having a really systems driven uh kind of approach to like understand actually what's happening will keep you from like going off down the wrong path uh, very early on uh, i love this answer uh so basically you said if you are new to this role in a company just wait a second study yeah. and then you know start with your own things <laughs> yeah absolutely that's, yeah that's right really understand good. yeah um there at facebook we had a framework called understand identify execute in that order so i love that understand you had to understand <laughs> yeah what the goals are uh why the project makes sense um does every do, do people agree that it makes sense and then once you understand the real problem that you're trying to solve then you can identify the best opportunity within there and once you've d done that then when you execute your likelihood of success is going to be so much so much higher uh, when i was at facebook we were looking at um optimizing a uh, sign up page for Facebook, mm. you know, people coming and creating new, new accounts. And we're like, Hey, we, we think we can do better, um, than the current, current version. And so, you know, if you start there, like we want to make the sign up better, your hypotheses are very all over the board. You might say, Hey, we need to change the value proposition, the headline. We, maybe we should add a video, uh, to the landing page to explain why you should join. Maybe we should, redesign the whole thing altogether or change the number of fields that we ask for. Um, and that would send you off on very different paths, right? Uh, for, and it could be very long journeys. Uh, but what we, what we did instead is we really tried to dig in and say, okay, what are the problems people are experiencing when they get to this page? And, you know, we found very specifically that, um, people, certain groups of people were seeing, um, password errors where they were setting passwords that were too short. Hmm. Right. And, and it was a significant amount of people that were kind of, this was getting in the way for them. And so now when you have that deeper understanding, like now all of the ideas that you have are much more, they're like more tactical, they're scoped and narrow. Uh, you can kind of clearly think about like, now we're talking about how do we improve inline form validation? How do we improve the copy around the password field to encourage people to set the right blanks the passwords how do we think about the logic in the back end that's throwing these errors and can we do anything about it and so now our likelihood of success is much greater because we've really narrowed down on the solution you know two minutes two minutes ago we were maybe thinking about creating video and putting it on the landing page <laughs> now we're talking about improving uh form validation so it's th that kind of understanding and then identifying before you start to execute that i think the best growth teams do really well so, so, so say the framework again. How how was that? So it's, it's uh, understand? understand, identify, and execute. And I actually, it, it maps really well to the um, uh, the growth framework in hacking growth, where um, you know you have IDA, yeah. prioritize, test, analyze, uh, and it's a similar type of model where yeah, you want to understand the problem, then you want to create uh, a bunch. Once you identify the problem, then you want to create ideas and prioritize ideas, and then test. And too often people start at the ideas 
uh, you mm -hmm. know, without really deeply understanding uh, the, the problems first. Yeah. Uh, you said before that you hate the word growth hacking <laughs> because now it means, you know, a lot of different things. Uh, and most of the time when they use growth hacking, they are talking about, you know, tips and tricks and, you know, yep. the, the magic bullets and, you know, bots and strange things. Do you still use the word growth hacking? I mean, when you talk yeah. with your team or, you know, with, with, with partners and customers and. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I typically, so I don't hate the word. I just think the word's been, it, it, it creates different connotations and people have different expectations when you say it. So to kind of like disambiguate, I just use growth now um, because mm -hmm. no one, no, every, no one argues with growth. Right. So <laughs> I think the, uh, everyone's like, yes, I want to grow more. I want my business to be more successful. I want yeah. more, you know, whatever. So growth is like not controversial, um, but the hacking part seems to be. So yeah, I really focus on uh, growth. Um, and I think, you know, the hacking part was really about bringing this technical capability and yeah. this experimental thought process to traditional marketing. I think, you know, when the, um, when the internet has kind of evolved and then also a lot of these uh, web 2.0 properties, social networks, you know, historically what people tried to do was graft traditional marketing frameworks and tactics onto these new channels, uh, which some work and some don't. Uh, and I think where growth hacking came from was kind of a more digitally native kind of uh, awareness of how these online products actually grow. Um, and then, you know, the t the term kind of took off because it, I think it answered a, a question that people had, which was why does the traditional marketing not seem to work as well or be as uh, super high priority as other companies that are growing really fast? Like, what is the difference? And, um, and so, you know, from there, you know, all sorts of uh, ideas got spun up around it. So I actually think it's good that there's a phrase that people either love or hate uh, because it means they <laughs> care. I think if you create a phrase and um, no one says anything, then they probably don't care enough to. Uh, yeah, to yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but I think uh, in general, I think growth is um, easy to get people aligned and bought into uh, versus growth hacking. And do you think in your experience, do you think that the growth hacking approach or the growth approach yeah. works with, you know, uh, all kind of companies? I mean, can we do that on like, you know, more traditional businesses and like, you know, small businesses, SMEs and, yeah. and so on? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think if you think of it in terms of this, like hypothesis driven experimental approach, uh, that uses um, cross-functional teams and data to kind of inform what to do, um, then yes, for sure. Like, I think there's lots of great examples of, of companies that have, um, that have embraced this type of, whether they call it, you know, growth hacking, whether they call it uh, agile development, whether they call it lean or whatever, these same principles of trying to accelerate learning uh, and, and, um, and validate assumptions faster applies everywhere. Um, I talked to the former president of Taco Bell, which is a big fast food, you know, chain um, uh, here in the States. And, and they created some test uh, stores right outside the doors of their corporate headquarters oh, wow. where they could put new menu items specifically into those stores to get feedback really fast corporate office and then iterate. Um, and they had a couple of breakout hits here in the States with like new menu items through that that innovation and rapid testing kind of process. So I think if you can do it fast food, uh, you can do it um, with all sorts of things, uh, both, you know, more traditional businesses. I talked to uh, the head of um, the former head of Walmart uh, labs, uh, mm. where they kind of built a team, an internal growth hacking team uh, to kind of um, tie together all of their offline data to their online marketing programs. And they built, um, you know, a bunch of infrastructure so that they could inform their paid search uh, ads based on their pricing and inventory. Levels That's cool. In their <laughs> and so, yeah. So I think like you get down into the nitty gritty, it can be used in a bunch of places. Um, there's probably some places where it should not be used. Uh, like, like, I, like what? Like I think, um, 
you would never want to like A-B test a safety feature on a Tesla, right? Just yeah, like- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give, give, give it to everyone, <laughs> I, right? I agree with you um, on that one, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think there are certainly moral, ethical boundaries where um, there are some things that are just everyone should get right away that are mm. like, you know, good and, and you don't want to test those. And there's also things that you want to have different degrees of uh, rigor in terms of um, what you're optimizing for and and not, and really thinking about kind of second order consequences of, of okay. some of the things that you build. So I think, uh, you know, Robin Hood's been in the news lately a lot <laughs> at, in the States with like GameStop and you kind of think about, okay, if we make it easy and fun to trade options, what are the downstream mm. effects of that? And so you kind of want to- I see uh, what you mean. Think through the implications of some of the so, so So do you think, I, I, I want to go deeper in that. So do you think that there are, you know, industries where uh, you cannot have this approach or, or you should not have this approach? Yeah, I mean, I think um, industries that are uh, highly regulated that have to deal, um, you know, uh, like people's health uh, and, mm. and those types of things, um, I think you really want to be very intentional about what you're doing and you obviously want to make sure that you understand what um the regulatory uh, environment is and the laws are because um they're there for a reason right and so hmm. um yeah i think like uh when you're when you're dealing with um areas of like great consequence um then you want to think very much through not just what uh, you're trying to achieve with your business, but what the the next order effect is. So if you are able to accomplish this, what does that mean down mm -hmm. the line? And so, um, you know, I think uh, Jeff Bezos says, uh, or Elon Musk also says this, like most decisions are reversible, right? And, mm -hmm. the, and the decisions that are reversible, you can kind of test and iterate through very quickly. And then there are some decisions that are not reversible. Um, and those you should be very slow and methodical and kind of think through. And I think the same is true in growth. There are many situations where um, we're moving too slow, just as a default. You know, one of the phrases that people love to say to me is like, well, Morgan, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And what I like to say is that the world's best marathon runners run marathons in under two hours now. You know, so like even, even the best marathoners are sprinting for 26 miles. So it's kind of like <laughs> where, your, where your calibration yeah, uh, is. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I think, um, so by default, I think we typically move uh, too slow, but I think there are certain industries, decisions, uh, outcomes that we need to be uh, thinking through. And I always tell my team, we wanna be fast like a Formula One car, not fast like a runaway truck who's lost its brakes down, going down a mountain, right? And I think that means <laughs> you wanna be fast and precise and in control, you don't wanna be fast and out of control yeah. and not knowing what's going to happen next. I love that image. I'm going to use it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you a, a couple of, you know, cool and new examples of, you know, big companies, you know, using the, the, the growth approach, but you already told yeah. me uh, yeah. Taco Bell and, 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 and Walmart. Uh, do you have any yeah. cool names that you have heard of in the last um, know, couple of years? Yeah, I was kind of kind kind of digging around. Um, you know, I think uh, an interesting one that was kind of fun um, that just happened uh, recently is obviously Disney launched Disney Plus, uh, their mm -hmm. online streaming service, and one of the things they did for their customer acquisition uh, efforts is they launched a baby name registry, uh, not a registry, a ba baby name glossary where you, you mm. can like if you search like best baby, like new baby names for like 2020 or like popular boy baby names in the United States, like Disney plus will now rank very high uh, <laughs> for a bunch of pages with names that you can give your kids. And, um, you know, I think that's a really interesting kind of approach to uh, growth where they understand, okay, their target audience is parents. Um, yeah. If you're searching for baby names, it's probably likely that you have other kids or that soon enough you will have someone in their target <laughs> target audience and it's a really low cost way um to build up a very large remarketing audience effectively mm -hmm. or a lookalike audience uh 
population. And so I thought that was a very smart kind of digital marketing. That's pretty cool. By the Disney Plus team. Um, and you can yeah, Google I, it. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good I'm, I'm going to check it out. Yeah, that's, that's smart. Yeah. So kind of I, the one that, the reason I like that is because um, to your point about building community, like sometimes you have to build these assets that then become you know, powerful inputs down the road, right? So it may not yeah, be obvious absolutely. that like Disney, baby names is the right thing for Disney Plus because obviously you have to be at least a few years old, you know, to kind of like mm -hmm. enjoy the content. But uh, if you think through it, it's like, oh, I see what they're doing here. They're trying to build uh, an audience that they can then remarket to target with, you know, more cost-effective ads. They can mm -hmm. uh, build their audience of um, potential parents uh, and uh, to create like new segments to kind of target their digital advertising. And so kind of thinking through, um, you know, they can definitely understand their target audience, how that yeah. audience grows and then how they can expand uh, the performance and the reach of those tactics by opening up um, the addressable audience through some low cost uh, digital marketing uh, yeah. strategies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was wondering, um, what's what's the future of of growth hacking right now? I mean, there is a lot going on, you know, on the privacy mm -hmm. side. Uh, you yep. know, here in Europe with GDPR, but all over around the world, you know, it's changing a lot. Yeah. Um, there is a a lot also going on, you know, with technologies and machine learning, you know, AI, this kind of stuff. So. Yep. What do you think is the future of growth hacking in this, you know, in this couple of years? Yeah, I think so to your point, there's there's a lot going on. I think some things will always be true. I think the things that will always be true is that companies will always be looking to grow and and drive mm -hmm. the their performance. I think um, the ability to move faster um, have a higher likelihood of successful outcomes and have more understanding of what you're doing, whether it's work, is it working or not, will always be true. And so I think a lot of the the pre like a lot of the conditions that exist today for why growth hacking has become so popular and why this rapid iteration um, and kind of data driven approach to uh, digital growth has uh, and growth in general has kind of really taken off is that these things are always important. And this is like a new uh, a new way to think about kind of accelerating. Um, the success there. And so uh, even as things change, as like privacy laws change and that type of thing, the desires of the companies and, and kind of the the um, benefits of being able to move fast, be more successful, more regularly, mm. and all those types of things will always be valuable. I do think the tactics and how we think about things will change. So for example, you know, uh, one of the things I love about your community approach that we've talked about a lot today is that um, you know, when you have a community who's opted in and, and who's passionate about your brand and who believes in it, like, it doesn't matter if you can't, you know, target them in a, because they use an iPhone and it doesn't, you know, it, like they are engaged and they're, they're uh, willingly, you know, they're here participating. And so I think if you're in growth, you want to think about, and this kind of goes back to some of the paid uh, advertising that I talked about earlier is that, if you're relying on a third party to reach your customer, um, you're kind of you're basically paying rent to that third to yeah. that third party to access those customers, and it is going to get harder and harder to do that because most of the laws are really focused on these third parties and the way that they provide you information to go yeah. be super effective reaching those customers. But that kind of becomes less and less important the more that your customers are kind of. We, we would call it first party, right? The first party data. Um, but like, really, it's like bringing your customers into your orbit in such a way that, yeah. you know, regardless of being able to target them um, on some yeah. ad platform, you have them in your ecosystem already. So I think that's definitely going to change. I think the, uh, to your point about um, machine learning, I think uh, predictive models are going to get better and better and uh, more and more important. And they're going to become more accessible to use. Um, when I was at Facebook uh, on my team, we had uh, 18 machine learning engineers um, working on uh, you know, ranking and relevance, recommendation systems, um, and all of these types of things. And, and um, 
these will become more and more ubiquitous and accessible for all types of businesses to use. And I think the important thing there is, uh, again, it's just another tool in your toolkit. Mm. But I think you still need some of these foundational things that we've talked about, like really understanding your customer, yeah. what they need, will they buy it. So I think, yeah, these this will continue to evolve. There'll be new tools, there'll be new uh, methods, but the underlying needs kind of remain. Yeah, and probably, uh, I mean, if I if I if I got it right, you are saying that it's super important to build your own, you know, assets. Yeah. Now more than ever. So yeah, please absolutely. build your own assets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, you said it far more elegantly and succinctly. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to keep you here. Um, I, I just have a you know a, a, a couple of um, last questions. So yeah. What's the best book, uh, I don't know, that you have read recently? We love books yeah. on my YouTube yeah. channel, on my blog, my podcast. We talk a lot about books, so I had awesome. to ask. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I read uh, like nonstop. It's it's my hobby. I love I love reading. So this is this is great. So the the book that I'm um, wrapping up right now has been excellent. It's called uh, The Art of Science and Engineering: uh, Learning mm. to Learn. And what it's it's by uh, Richard Hamming, and he is a professor uh, who basically gave a series of lectures to computer science and engineering majors about how to think about thinking um, and how to kind of reason from first principles and how to apply that method of thinking to the advancement of computer science, AI, and software engineering uh, generally. And it's, it's a fantastic read because it combines a lot of stuff that I love. It's you know a lot of math, um, but a lot of uh, thinking about thinking. And, um, and so just a fascinating read. So uh, the art of uh, science and engineering is a really great one. I also re recently finished uh, The Book of Why by Judea Pearl which is all about understanding uh, causality versus correlation, which I think is really important in uh, yeah, growth. super important <laughs> if you work with data. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's kind of the science of uh, understanding causality, which, uh, which I, um, I, is really fascinating just in general as a, as a topic. Um, like how do we know something causes something else, yeah. right? Like, uh, the rooster crows when the sun rises, but we know the rooster crowing is not the reason the sun <laughs> rises. Um, yeah. You know, but like, how do we how do we prove those? Uh, really prove the causality of things in different systems is really interesting. That's, um, that's and pretty then, cool. Yeah, yeah, and then the last one is I read a uh, just before that I finished uh, the Model Thinker, which is a book by Scott Page, which basically says that the way we typically think about the world, like humans, kind of default to thinking about systems that are linear in nature, right? Like that, uh, you know, everything from like a, a recipe, if we, if the recipe makes uh, serve six, uh, but we wanna make it for 12, we kind of double all the ingredients. And we know that's mm. wrong when you say that, right? Like the chef will tell <laughs> that's you- That's what I terrible. do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, but I'm not a, but like, you know, I'm not a chef, but, um, but we think about all, a lot of systems in that same way, in that linear, uh, model and the fact is there's many different models and systems behave very mm -hmm. differently so you have uh convex systems so exponential growth you know yeah. the humans are not very good at processing exponential growth and what it means um same things with like uh concave growth models which are things like paid advertising uh if you're spending two dollars right now and you're making four you assume that you can just spend four and make eight but we know that that linear relationship doesn't hold, right? You reach saturation points and that type of thing. And so uh, the model thinker basically lays out a bunch of these different mental models and then talks to you about how to use them to apply them to help mm -hmm. inform your thinking. So those are three that I've recently read that I really yeah, love. Super cool. So okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the link, the links of the cool. three books in the description below. And uh, awesome. what about tools? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully Do you have any? Available. Oh, hopefully they're Sorry? available from I was going to say, hopefully they're available from independent booksellers uh, near you. Support your local bookseller. I, I, I will check. I will check that also. Uh, what about tools? Um, do you have any cool, you know, marketing tools that you have been using lately? Uh, yeah, nothing. Nothing exciting or flashy. I mean, 
the probably the biggest tool is like SQL. Um, it's really <laughs> unsatisfying, I think. Um, so yeah, I don't have a lot of uh, great like, oh, this is a snazzy cool tool to do um, X, Y, Z. Um, I think some tools that I always look out for though uh, are typically from, you know, if you're worried about like customer acquisition, uh, the, mm -hmm. the tools that I look for are the things that come from the places where the customers are. So, you know, if Instagram launches a new ad format, I'm very interested in that, right? Because new ad formats typically are less competitive. Um, they're mm -hmm. easy to under, they're like easy to get into and try very cheaply. Uh, and you know, when you enter, when you buy an ad, you're entering an auction. And so the fewer people, the newer the auction and the fewer people that are in the auction, the uh, easier it is to get advantage out of it, right? Um, if you're playing poker against people who have never played poker before, it's a much easier game than playing uh, professionals. So I look for tools that come from the places where our channels are. So if Google introduces a new tool, a new ad format, Facebook introduces a new tool, new ad format, I'm very keenly interested in understanding those and trying those out as soon as possible. I love that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, I want to close with a uh, last one, um, a personal one. W what do you think yeah. your biggest, you know, challenge uh, in Shopify for you, you know, this year in 2021? Yeah, I think the the biggest challenge um, uh, will be, um, you know, kind of keeping up with the the shifts that were that we're seeing you know uh, in in the United States for example in 2020 more small businesses were created last year uh, than any I think any in the last 20 years you know so like huge wow. demands for entrepreneurship I think people uh, are really um, you know they've seen a lot of instability they've seen a lot of change they've lost their job they've lost loved ones uh, they've seen businesses around them that their families own close. And so, uh, you know, what I love about us as people is when the going gets tough, the tough get going, you know, they get after it. Uh, and so <laughs> entrepreneurship and kind of like taking control of your uh, economic destiny is, is an imperative around the world. Um, and as technology uh, reaches more places, as you're able to conduct business right from your phone, um, like how does Shopify get to all those people and, and mm. make it as accessible and easy and, and like make the option of entrepreneurship as, as easy and as successful as possible. So like, how do we go, you know, I'm sitting here in Southern California, how do we make sure that entrepreneurs in India, in Brazil, in yeah. Italy can, uh, can take that step? And how do, so that's the biggest challenge is how do we do that? Uh, in a way that's really um, uh, successful for entrepreneurs there. We do it in a way that makes sense uh, for them and meets their needs. And uh, we we open up that option to as many people as possible. And that is a inspiring mission. It's a daunting <laughs> vision in some ways. And so how do we do that uh, in the most effective way possible is certainly going to be the biggest challenge, which uh, is like a super exciting challenge to try to go run down. Cool, cool. Love it. I love it. Morgan, thank you so much for your time. It was it yeah, was it was it was great. great. It was it was, it was great. great. It was super cool. Yeah, thanks, super thanks, cool. thanks for having me. Um and I love learning uh from all the work that you're doing. So yeah, keep up the great work. Uh, it's always great to connect with smart folks cool. uh, in the space. Cool. Thanks again. Thank Have a nice one. <laughs> See you soon. Bye bye.